Hi, this is Stephen Gilbert, and I'm excited to share a few moments of talking to you about transformation. How does the human being experience transformation? I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and as people come to see me, there's something going on in their life that they need change, whether it's uh, a relationship or a life experience. It usually boils down to something that's going on with them internally. The scriptures talk about uh, we are born fundamentally kind of broken. I like to think in terms of the broken human self, that that broken human self needs to change, to grow, to develop, to be healed. So in the next few moments, I want to talk about kind of an introduction as to what would that look like for you to go through an experience of inner healing, transformation, and growth. So in Luke's Gospel in chapter 4, we have a really great scene where Jesus shows up at his hometown in Nazareth, at his synagogue, and he's handed uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He reads Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 in our modern Bible. And in it, he declares what I would say, the release of the kingdom. He is coming into the world for what purpose? To release the kingdom of God. And Luke positions it in such a way that Luke understands that this is Jesus' inaugural address. And from there, Jesus begins to do in Luke's account all the things that he describes in that passage. Well, in that passage, it describes that he's come with the anointing of the Holy Spirit to release people, to heal them, to set them free, to deliver them. And it's exciting because that's the purpose of Jesus. Now, when we think of the incarnation, Jesus as a, as a man, God-man, enters into our world. And why does he come to us? Because he's on a mission to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. And what is it? He has to overcome sin and death because of this broken place that we find ourselves in as humanity. Jesus comes, invades our world to what? To set us free. And that's what he's announcing in Luke chapter 4. So there's a theme here that Jesus does for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. How does Jesus do that? Well, in John's Gospel, chapters 14, 15, and 16, you see Jesus getting to prepare his disciples for his departure. Jesus knows that he's going to confront sin and death on the cross and eventually be raised and enthroned in heaven. But he tells them this, he goes, no longer do I call you my servants, but I call you my friends. So you see this intimacy with Jesus, that he's connected with them, he loves them. And he says, I'm not gonna leave you as orphans, but I'm gonna go to my father in heaven, who he would refer to as Abba, Daddy. And he says, and I'm going to tell him to send the friend to you guys so that I can be with you always. So there's this sense that Jesus is going to go away. And he says, it's better that I go away, that the friend will come, the Holy Spirit, and he will indwell your life so that I will be with you always. And he will make sense of everything I've shared with you. He even says this, that you're about to come alive. That's pretty profound. Now, they're obviously rather confused and scared. But the thought would be Jesus wants to have a direct conduit to these 12. And it's no different than you and me. He wants to have a conduit to us as well. And it's through that conduit that we can experience this transformation, this healing, this release that I've described. In the early church, the first and second century, the church called this the process of theosis. Theosis was the idea that if the Holy Spirit comes into human life, that power, that presence, that same spirit that we see in the, in the creation story in Genesis, who's hovering over the waters, the same spirit that we see in Ephesians chapter 1, that through his power is raising Jesus from the dead and enthroning him in heaven, that same spirit as it comes to indwell the human life, from the inside out transformation comes. By us yielding to the leadership of that Holy Spirit, the presence of the indwelling Christ in our life, we would be able to overcome obstacles and overcome areas of our life, over actually aspects of our personality that cause problems for us. These are the areas that the Holy Spirit comes and changes us 
as we yield and learn to follow his leadership in our life. So what is the Holy Spirit up against? Well, the Apostle Paul writes very clearly in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8. Romans 7 is the problem. What does Paul say? He says that the very good that he desires to do, he can't do. But the very evil that he desires not to do, he finds himself doing. Who can't relate to that, right? Well, that's what the Holy Spirit is up against. And in that passage, it's incredible. Paul makes a statement that I think is scandalous. He says twice in the, new, in the NIV translation, he says, when I long for Christ, when I long in my mind and my heart that that's what I want, the very good that I want, the fact that he wants it and doesn't do it, he says, therefore, it is no longer I who sin. That's a bold statement. He says it twice. He says, rather, it's not I who sin, but it is sin that dwells within my members or in my sinful flesh. So the Holy Spirit is up against this broken nature that we have as human beings, this sinful place, this broken flesh. The Holy Spirit's up against that, but we know the Holy Spirit has overcome it. We know the Holy Spirit has enthroned Jesus in heaven. So therefore, we should be able to believe that the Holy Spirit, through His power and our yielding to that presence in our life, is able to transform us, is able to set us free. All the things that Jesus is saying, that that's why He's come in the first place, to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. So Romans 7 is the problem. Romans 8 is the solution. So then Paul says that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. When we are found in Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, Paul starts to describe a life led by that presence overcomes sinful flesh. Later on in the church, we began to describe that process as sanctification. So that the Holy Spirit begins to lead us out of the darkness into the light. That the image that has been marred by sin and by our brokenness, the image of God, how we are created, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begins to cause us to be illuminated again. That He ends up shining that image so that we once again reflect that image and not only reflect it, but cast it and shine it out into the world around us. That's the process of theosis, the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us out of the darkness of our broken sinful flesh into the light of who He created us to be. I hope that you find this process of theosis encouraging, that you're not alone. You know, there is a lot of self-help out there in books and even in modalities of therapy. I work with a lot of self-help and modalities of therapy that suggest that it's all up to you. But what if it's true that Jesus isn't going to leave us as orphans, that he sent his Holy Spirit, delights in doing it, delights in indwelling our lives, coming into the darkness so that he can set us free, that we're not doing this all up to ourselves, but that there is a power beyond imagination that is able to lead us into a new place. Peter writes in his first letter, in chapter 1, verse 15, in the message it says this, As obedient children, allow yourselves to be pulled into a God-shaped life, energetic and blazing with holiness. If you think in terms of the action, the verbs, what are we doing? We're allowing ourselves to be pulled. That's a process of surrender. It's a process that says, I see these things in my life and I I keep running into them. I keep bunning into them, but I can't seem to overcome them. It's a willingness and a surrender that says, but I'm willing to have you lead me into a new place. The other verb, who's the one that's doing the pulling? It's the Holy Spirit. See, I believe that the Holy Spirit has prepared for us a place a place of freedom, a place of transformation. And all we have to do is to begin to surrender the things in our lives that are keeping us from entering into that. We'll talk about that at another time. But right now, are you willing to take hold of Jesus' hand through the power of the Holy Spirit to be pulled into a new life that He's already preparing for you? I hope so. 
I look forward to explaining that further. Thanks. Thanks.